Hey everybody, happy Halloween and welcome to the first official video here in the cinema lobby. My name is Paul Davis. If you don't know who I am or you haven't come from the other YouTube channel that I do, uh, I'm a filmmaker. I directed two segments of the Blumhouse Hulu Into the Dark series, The Body and Uncanny Annie. I'm an author. I've written two books on the making of an American Wealth in London and The Lost Boys. Made an American Wealth in London documentary. Um, just an all-round huge cinema nerd, parapsychology nerd. I love movies. I love things that are spooky. So kind of perfect that we're opening with um, today's video, which I've been teasing for the best part of a month. Um, and I'm not going to do a, a long overblown intro because I just want to get straight to it because there's over 30 minutes worth of outtakes from The Exorcist that I'm going to be showing you today, uh, most of which have never been seen before. Um, it's still boggling my mind how I came into possession of these, pardon the pun, um, but I have them and I don't know how I have them and so I'm going to share them with you today um, and of course it includes the infamous uh, makeup test that Eileen Dietz performed uh, that then very famously became known as the face of Pazuzu or Captain Howdy, whatever your preference is. Um, which to me, uh, being a fan of the movie, being a fan of Mark Kermode's BBC documentary, The Fear of God, um, which in itself came out 25 years ago, um, has been the holy grail of outtakes. So when I finally saw it for the first time, my bearded jaw just dropped. Um, so I'm happy to be able to show you the whole two minute reel from that, plus another 30 odd minutes of outtakes. Um, that I'm hoping you'll, you'll enjoy. And I'm going to provide a commentary for you just to give some context of a, a lot of stuff. The majority of it doesn't have any sound um, because it was shot MOS, but um, those that do have sound, I'll let the sound play. Um, I'll try and get a little bit of context in there during the silence. But um, yeah, I'll shut up. Let's jump straight into it. Okay, folks, so before I hit play, I just want to ask you guys to please like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so that you never miss a video. I'm going to be coming back with a lot of stuff like this, uh, exclusive interviews with other filmmakers, uh, trailer commentaries, full movie commentaries. Um, I've got a really cool thing coming up for fans of An American Wolf in London, um, a little sequence from that film in a way that you've never seen it before. So you don't want to miss out on this channel. But as promised, let's dive into The Exorcist. Okay, so we're starting with the um, the sequence that really was the first indication that I'd stumbled onto something special. Um, and it's the, the deleted scene in which Chris McNeil is, is taking Reagan on a birthday outing around um, the Arlington Memorial and then the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, uh, which was in Freakin's original 140-minute first cut of the film, which Blatty you know, maintained was the perfect version. Um, but once, uh, Freakin showed the movie to Ted Ashley and John Kelly, who Ted Ashley was running Warner Brothers and uh, John Kelly was the head of production. Uh, John Kelly actually gave, uh, Billy Freakin some notes suggesting, uh, a few trims just to tighten the pacing of the film. And this was one of those scenes. Um, and it's great, you know, B Billy being Billy, thanked him for his notes and then as soon as he left the room was like who the fuck is this guy to tell me what to do with my film but the more he started to think about it the more the notes made sense so this scene was among those that was cut um and among its its placing in in the film i mean it's mentioned in the sequence between chris mcneil and linda blair when she's tucking her into bed um, but a lot of those early scenes were rearranged um, differently to how it was in the original script. So this scene would have immediately followed Chris McNeil in the attic, um, investigating the, the noises and being scared by Carl, the servant, in the, the hatch to the attic. Um, but there was a deleted scene before that in which um, after Chris McNeil has tucked Reagan into bed, She's then working in her study and Reagan comes downstairs and complains that um, her bed's shaking. So Chris puts her to bed in her room and then that's when she goes up into the attic. Um, but obviously it was, it was changed around in, in the finished cut. And that scene, we, there's, there are stills that exist of Reagan coming down to the study 
Um, but we've never actually seen any footage from that. And I do believe that that sequence was never included in any cut of the film. Um, so that's probably why we've, we've never, we've never seen it. Um, but yeah, this was shot relatively early in the, the Georgetown portion of the filming because they started off, um, in New York in August of 1972 and they filmed a bunch of stuff there and then they, they moved the unit to Georgetown, shot all the stuff on location. Um, and this, uh, sequence um, as mentioned, was in uh, Freakin's original version. He actually wanted to reinstate it for the, the 2000 uh, version you've never seen because there's uh, a line from Reagan when they're at the tomb of the unknown soldier where she asks, uh, Mother, why do people have to die? And Chris kind of taken aback by that because before this moment we we've only seen you know a, a happy smiley little girl um it's not until after this sequence where you know you would have had the sequence with uh, chris getting agitated with oh there's billy <laughs> uh you would have seen uh, chris getting agitated on the phone and swearing and and Ra the camera pulls back to reveal reagan looking depressed and all that kind of stuff so this is the first sequence that kind of a shows Reagan's preoccupation with death, asking why people have to die, and Chris's response, in which she rather flippantly says, well, you know, God gets lonely, you know, um, so he makes people get tired so that he can have us back, and then Reagan asks, you know, why, why does God make us get tired? To which Chris then asks, why, you know, where have you been learning about God? And she reveals that Sharon who's Chris McNeil's assistant, played by Kitty Wynn, um, has been talking to her about religion, uh, which fits in with a couple of other scenes that were that were filmed and deleted, uh, in which uh, it's revealed that Sharon is into transcendental meditation, um, and there were some sequences shot during the party, um, which are in the book, uh, with a character called Mary Jo Perrin, who's um, like a white witch, um, you know, the Georgetown local occult kook, um, you know, which was, which was a, a, a thing back then. And, you know, if you were a, a, a Hollywood A-list celebrity, you know, it did you well to have an occultist at your social gatherings. So that, that was, you know, kind of Mary Jo Perrin's place in the film. And there were, there were dialogue sequences between her and Sharon that were shot that, uh, revealed that she was lending Sharon... Um, a book on the occult so it was just stacking the deck of all these things um, that could have suggested that Reagan wasn't possessed and that she was learning these things um, but I think the more they kind of got into it they realized look the audience aren't stupid they're gonna come in knowing that this is a, a film about a little girl who's possessed so let's not let, let, let's not try and pull the wall over anybody's eyes here, you know. And so this is the little dialogue sequence I just spoke about, where, where Reagan's asking Chris why people have to die. Um, and um, a wonderful little sequence, uh, as I mentioned, Freakin wanted to put it back in the 2000 cut, but when Mark Kermode uncovered these sequences in early 1998, um, they couldn't find the sound reel. For this and there were there were many instances where things were either erroneously labeled or they just outright could not find um various bits and pieces so the other way. no we do it this way i'm rolling okay stand by action okay this particular test tells us exactly what the impulses are coming from your heart what i'd like you to do is to put your hands like this very good Relax, breathe normally, remain perfectly still. Okay. We'll be almost through. Remain relaxed. Very good. And slide. 83 George, take two. And slide. 
you know, as as has been mentioned uh, countless times, where possible, Billy liked to use um, real professionals when he was filming. You know, in in this case, you know, the, all the medical scenes that was a real nurse, that wasn't an actress. Um, he used real priests in the movie. He used real cops in the French Connection, um, and you know that comes out of his documentary background, um, and it just adds to the authenticity of the uh, of the piece. So this uh, this sequence was obviously used very very briefly in the two thousand cut, in which it's that the the first reuse of the uh, of the Eileen Dietz Captain Howdy demon face, which is. Uh, you know, become so iconic with the film now. Okay, so here's some fun stuff. Get some spider walk going. So I, I've mentioned this numerous times before publicly. Um, and, you know, there are people that like it, and I get that, and I respect it. Uh, but the one thing that I just is egregious to me about the 2000 cut is the inclusion of the spider walk. It just doesn't fit for me it doesn't fit with the the um the escalation of of reagan's manifestation it it feels too much like we haven't seen anything like this and then we kind of don't see anything close to a moment like this until much later so I, I, I thought it was the right decision to cut it. And in fact, you know, uh, Billy Freakin didn't actually finish the sequence. He watched the dailies. You know, you could, uh, you could see the wires um, as uh, uh, Anne Miles is coming down the, the, the steps. And he looked at the dailies and just thought, yeah, we're moving on. You know, which is why, you know, the, everything that you're seeing here was what was shot for the, for the spider walk apart from the take that ended up being in the 2000 cut in which um, the contortionist Anne Miles had uh, blood squibs in her mouth. Um, and that take was actually found after they'd done all of the, the Fear of God stuff. So, um, and I, I don't think Billy wanted it back in the movie. I think it was one of those situations where the only reason, Warner, the only condition in which... So that was the take that was used in The Fear of God. This is an alternate take that has never been seen before. So what you saw there was everything that was shot for the spider walk. Billy abandoned the scene. He didn't film any um, reaction stuff for Chris and Sharon. There were no close-ups or anything. The scene was done. So, so we get to see it. That's the fun part. Now the significance of this and why I'm showing this is because the shot in which the head goes all the way around 360 degrees was the only take they did of that because it wasn't initially intended that her head went all the way around. The idea was that it went back 180 and then came back. So that's what you just saw there. And there are multiple takes of them doing the 180, never 360. Um, so yeah, another little thing that just happened in the editing that, you know, Billy had a hunch you know, we'll film one, see how it looks, and that's what they ended up using in the movie. And I just love seeing these these little moments where, you know, they yell cut and this demonic child just goes back to being Linda Blair again. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And there's one of the most chilling moments in the movie where that Mercedes McCambridge laugh is coming out of Linda Blair's mouth. It's it's such an achievement to this, I mean, to this day. This really interested me. So, if you look at the finished scene in the house, so this is the shot right before 
where Reagan is anticipating the arrival of Father Marin. If you look at her left eye, there is a little bit of backlighting there. So that's obviously the little test that they did to see how that worked. So this is some of the extra stuff that they shot with Eileen Dietz. Um, we'll, I'll get into the story. Ah, here we go. Here's the Holy Grail. So what I was about to say, this was the first thing that was shot in terms of um, what that face went on to be. And this was a makeup test for Reagan uh, that was worn by Eileen Dietz because there were several makeups. In fact, m most of the makeups were worn, were tested by both Blair and Dietz because obviously there were moments where Dietz was going to have to do some of the things that, that Linda couldn't. So this was a, a very early makeup test that was applied by Dick Smith. And he showed it to Billy Freakin. And B Billy, you know, quite rightly said, well, you know, it's not organic. You know, it doesn't match any of the descriptions that, um, that are in the screenplay of how Reagan looks. So it was discarded and forgotten about. And it was quite late into the shoot where editor Bud Smith was already assembling sequences for Billy to watch. And he cut together the, the dream sequence, the Father Karras dream sequence, and just added two frames from this sequence. And it startled Freakin so much that he then wanted to go back and on the very last day, filming inside the, um, the, the duplicate Reagan bedroom set, which was four feet off the ground, and had various special effects that they had to do. Uh, they put Eileen Dietz back in the makeup, and that moment that you saw and what you see in like the flashing band trailer uh, was all the stuff that they shot on the last day where she's writhing around in the bed, and then they just did match cuts um, with fades to black. Um, you saw a couple of makeup tests there. Um, this was the the first makeup test among the first makeup tests that they did with Linda Blair and this is demonstrating just how visceral the the crucifix masturbation <laughs> sequence could have been I mean that's not subtle that <laughs> you know and I think you know you you look at a a moment like this and the ferocity with which, and because that's Linda Blair in the makeup, you can clearly see that that's Linda Blair. Um, the ferocity with which she is performing this sequence, she clearly has no understanding of what it is that the character is doing, which is great, you know, because Billy's job on the film would have been to protect her from from uh from things like that and you know it just looks as though she's stabbing something you know so it, it on the one hand you know you when you add some context to it and you know what the scene is yeah it looks absolutely brutal but you know she it also looks as though she didn't know exactly what the act was that she was doing or didn't understand what it was um so this is a a, a makeup where they're getting a little closer to the uh to the finished reagan look you can see that the the crack and the contortion in the lip is there but um for the rest of the makeup you've got raised kind of almost like boils as opposed to um the the welts that that it became with you know freaking suggesting that maybe it was something that reagan had done to herself to um to cause affliction to herself, to cause these raised, you know, gangrenous welts that um, that became that famous look. Um, and they went through several, I think it was about five or six makeups that, um, that Dick uh, tested on Linda because, you know, she was this really happy, smart, I mean, look at the, look at the, the apple cheeks on Linda, you know, so the, the biggest test for Dick Smith was making that scary, you know, and this is, of course, the, the makeup where Billy said, okay, I think we're getting somewhere. As you can see now, she's got open sores on the side of her face. So, um, uh, the teeth as well, you've got the addition of these, uh, large, uh, dentures in there, um, the cracked lip. So, encouraged by this 
Dick Smith then went on to, you know, add some more cuts and, and welts to the face and, um, yeah, create the, the look that, you know, became Reagan. Um, but you can see, you can, you can see the, the genesis. You can see that it's, um, the, the organic transformation from where this is and to where it goes. And I just, Linda's just having fun with it. It's, it's so nice to see moments like this because she literally went through hell when the movie came out. You know, she was hounded by the press. People were saying that, you know, that she suffered psychological damage while making the movie. When the movie came out, that she was institutionalized. Just all this kind of National Enquirer sensationalist bullshit that just wasn't true, you know. She was a 13-year-old girl when they started making it. Happy-go-lucky. I mean, you've seen the outtakes of her drinking milkshakes in between takes. This this is heartbreaking. This is the uh, the shot from the movie where, you know, the metal plate that was thrashing her in the bed came loose and was literally destroying her back. Um, so here's the very first test for, the, for Dick Smith's vomit mechanism which uh as you can probably see that's eileen deets wearing the uh the prosthetic and speaking of miss deets this is the test of her delivering the blow to dr klein um she was hired i think she was 24 25 at the time um she'd been seen in a play and was asked to audition because she was about the same size as linda blair um and because she was an adult her her physicality was a lot more believable than, than Linda's. Um, so yeah, so those of you who, who don't know what Eileen looked like in 1972, there you go, there she is. And that would have been, yeah, that would have been the, uh, the sequence in which Chris McNeil tastes some knuckle. Lovely. So this is a really cool sequence because when you're watching the movie, so this was an effect that was used in the sequence where the doctors uh, first come in and we see the first real manifestations of Reagan possessed. Um, and she goes nuts and then there's the implication that she's been slapped. Um, I had no idea that, the, <laughs> that this was how they did it. And it was an appliance that was stuck to her face and then very quickly whipped away to reveal this br this bruise on, on, underneath the, her face, which is such a cool effect. I don't know whether it really is noticeable in the film, but seeing it done that way, you know, I have a greater appreciation for it now. I mean, Dick Smith was such a fucking genius. You know, it's it's no it's no surprise that you look at the you know the roster of people that came up under his tutelage: Rick Baker, Craig Redden, um, you know, all these wonderful people. Uh, his dear Billy testing the uh, the scrolling wardrobe. I love the fact that he acts out the whole sequence. It's so cool. It's so cool to see. I normally associate that stuff with Spielberg, but it's great to see Billy doing it. So here we go. Oh, look, it's actually going this time. And as you notice, this is obviously different to how it played out in the the finished film. Because when Chris gets knocked to the floor, um, Sharon and Willie, the, um, the, the, the maid, the housemaid, run up the stairs. And then the door shuts. And then the wardrobe comes towards her. So that was obviously changed in the, in the blocking of the sequence. But, um, now this must have been one of the, well, in fact, you know what, it mu there's no point in me saying it must have been, I think, it, I think Linda Blair is on record as saying that the contact lenses were not particularly comfortable. Although I think, I think she said that the white, these particular contact lenses that completely whited out the eyes were the most comfortable. But just to give you some context, you know, anybody who wears contact lenses, 
back in the day, and in fact, even as late as uh, the Lost Boys, you know, because you see them, they wear those really cool kind of fiery contact lenses. They used hard acrylic half spheres that literally went over your eyeball. They were, you know, they were made of, you know, glass and acrylic, and they were not comfortable to wear at all. So, um, I think, you know, you see, you see it in Michael Jackson's Thriller when Michael Jackson compares putting in glass contact lenses to pouring Tabasco sauce in your eyes. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just can't imagine being 13 year, years old and, you know, the stuff that Linda went through and never complained is just absolutely unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. You know, and, you know, set aside some of the more controversial elements of this film, I don't know if you could even subject a 13-year-old child. I mean, I, I just saw Believer, but I, I, I think that those girls were a little bit older. But I don't think you, you definitely wouldn't get away with putting glass in a child's eyes these days. So... You know, the, the fact that, you know, when you look back at some of the the movies that have been made with great child actors and some of the things that they had to do is is, is remarkable. Um, so I, this one has been available online before, um, but it drove me nuts that it was, it was, the image seemed to be flipped, so I flicked it back the right way. This was... The little moment. Um, so Billy Freakin wasn't happy with the the hose effect of the vomit. So it was decided while they were shooting it that they were going to add an optical effect of the blob of vomit coming out of Reagan's mouth. So these were the elements that, that Linda shot to mimic the, the vomit, the stream of vomit flying out of her mouth. Um, to which then... Poor Jason Miller. Um, originally, it was supposed to hit him in the in the sweater, uh, but this is that take where it hit him in the face, and it was only it only hit him in the face the one time. Um, and if you keep looking on this, the further it goes, he waits for Billy to yell "cut," and then you see the smile creep on his face, which I think is great. You know, here it comes. There it is. <laughs> okay, we've got sound on this one. Oh, come on, shut up in there! I added that one because it's nice to hear Billy blow up. Why this girl doesn't make sense. I think the point is to make us despair. To see ourselves as animal and ugly. And to reject the possibility that God could love us. This girl doesn't make sense. I think the point is to make us despair. To see ourselves as animal and ugly. To reject the possibility that God could 
close. So this sequence, obviously, it was it was reinstated into the 2000 cut, but it wasn't in Billy's original 140-minute uh, version. Excuse he he quite simply left it as the two the moment of silence, which it was in the theatrical cut, which I prefer. Um, I think that Billy's instinct was to you know to leave you know a strong ambiguity. Two hundred thirty-two. Charlie, take was four. The right decision. Um, I don't feel like it needs to be explained. Uh, I added this because it was just a completely different angle on Jason no Miller's face. I thought it looked really interesting. this girl it doesn't make sense I think the point is to make us despair to see ourselves as animal and ugly to reject the possibility that God could love us Take five. I can appreciate why Blatty wanted it in the movie and why he wanted people to or why he wanted there to be a message that was clear and precise but um, you know life is full of ambiguity you know things will happen to you today that have no explanation and that's what I always loved about the theatrical cut of The Exorcist but um, you know, and th this sequence is, is another case in point. I, I think that it that Billy was right in that the original ending between Kinderman and Dyer from the book um, was just so anticlimactic after everything that happens. I mean, I get it. You know, Karis lives on, God's in his heaven, all is right. Um, and I think that it's a wonderful piece between Lee J. Cobb and, you know, and Father Bill O'Malley. But I don't think it adds anything to to what we've just seen. You know, I, I like the idea that, you know, the theatrical cut ends with Father Manley looking down at the steps where his best friend has just died. And, you know, the struggle goes on, you know. That battle is has has been won, but what's next, you know? And the fact that he just turns and walks away, end of movie, I think is perfect. But um, this is another one of those sequences where they managed to find uh very very late on they managed to find some of the onset sound um of of lee j cobb and and bill i father bill rec recording their lines um but the very last moment which is what these moments that are silent which in the the book and the screenplay is is uh lieutenant kenderman relating to this you know, coming together as the final scene of Casablanca where Bo Bogart turns to Claude Rains, says, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And then Father Bill says, you know, you look a little like Bogart. You noticed, which is that little repertoire that we had between Kinderman and Karras earlier on in the movie. Um, but Freakin has gone on to say that even if they did find that, that sound, because that was the only thing they couldn't find, that last exchange, that even if they had found it, that he probably still would have bookended the 2000 cut with the call to prayer from the Iraq sequence, because then it just brings everything full circle. Um, which I, which I think is a nice touch, but you know, my preference is, you know, the end of the movie, father die looks down the, at the stairs and walks away. They were toying with, you know, just after the movie came out. So we're talking back in 74, they were going to shoot a sequence where Jason Miller was coming back up the stairs, but they never did it. You know, I'm reminded of a line of a film, Casablanca. 
the only version of the soundtrack for that little exchange that, that exists. And as as it is in the the 2000 cut, this would have been the final shot of the movie. But with the Casablanca line, obviously. But, um, but guys, this is this has been the, the outtakes that I teased on social media for a while now to be perfectly honest with you i did have to be selective because when i actually went through the entire thing it turned out to be over an hour long so i just showed you kind of like the best of the best um because there were multiple takes of a lot of the stuff that i that i showed you but um guys i hope you enjoyed it you know i it, it's still it's remarkable to me that we can still find Wild track 1102R272. Take that we can still find these things, you know, 50 years after a movie came out, and we can still be enthralled by it. And, you know, The Exorcist is a film to me that that continues to live. It continues to find audiences. Um, and, you know, that's I think that that's the best thing that a movie can do. You know, the, the, the biggest test of a film is time. And if it stands to time and people still discover it, you know then you know both bill and billy can you know sit up there and look down and smile you know because they gave us something wonderful and if you haven't picked up the 4k yet do it because the theatrical cut is on there and it looks glorious so um that's all from me for now uh, i hope you enjoyed this um and i will be back with some more goodies at some point so take care folks <laughs> Oh! <laughs>